Good day and welcome along to the Retro Reboot Show. It is episode number two. I'll do that again for for the um, for the YouTube thumbnail. Episode two. So <laughs> episode two. Hey, how is it going? It is so good to be with you again. Um, sorry, it has been it's been a while since episode one. Um, but I didn't promise you that I would uh, do it in any particular time frame. I didn't say it was going to be two weeks or one week. I think it's been about two weeks uh, since the last one. But uh, I didn't say it was going to be any particular uh, length of time. I just said it, it was going to follow in some sort of routine basis. Now, the reason <laughs> that it has been uh, about two weeks is because um, I've been waking up every morning and uh, for the, some for some bizarre reason, it's been it's been like I've been drunk. I've been literally like my head's just been like, oh, I've I'm upside down today. I've literally been rolling around like I'm drunk. It's like I've got vertigo. It's I've, I have. I it's not like I have vertigo. I have vertigo. So tomorrow uh, I'm going to see a lovely nurse who's going to put a big needle in my ear. <laughs> Right in there, right in my eardrum, and hope for the best. So <laughs> that's going to be a lot of fun. So um, bear with me as I go through this um, rather sort of drunken, strange experience as I do the Retro Reboot Show in a strange kind of unbalanced kind of way. Isn't that great? But today, nonetheless, regardless of all of these things, today's Retro Reboot Show is going to be just as good as any other retro reboot show because it is jam-packed of lots of great retro reboot goodness for you. And I will get straight into it. Not only do we have uh, all of the usual news, we have uh, this day in the 1980s. And the year I have chosen, um, obviously it's this day in, so it's going to be a month and it's going to be August because we're in August. It's going to be 1982. So I have two stories from Byte magazine, nonetheless, in 1982, August thereof, the August edition. Uh, uh, so that's coming up near the end of today's episode of the show. But first, let's break straight into the news. And uh, yeah, let's let's go on with that. So straight over to my good friend Lunduk, uh, Brian Lunduk over at the Lunduk Journal, um, over on one of his um, uh, items on the, the Lunduk on his Substack. Uh, if you haven't joined over at the uh, Lunduk.substack.com, I highly recommend that you do. By the way, uh, he has Lunduk.substack.com and Lunduk locals.com you can join on either of those sites um lunduk.locals i think is kind of like a social hangout kind of place and then substack is kind of like the place where all his newsy stuff is um uh, there's a free tier and then there's a paid for tier i pay for my one and there's lots of great news on there so uh well worth checking out if you haven't checked it out already and some of the news that i get is from his place, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm clearly uh, stealing some news there from there, but uh, obviously with attribution, so there you go. But uh, this one he posted up actually a couple of weeks ago, so it's not new news anyway, and he's pro he's stolen it from somewhere else as well. So it's all it's all making sure that we're all sharing the news of, uh, of retroness anyway, so I don't think anybody's going to mind because we're all sharing the love, right? This one's great. If you are a fan of any of the LucasArts or LucasFilm games, right? Remember, they were LucasFilm before they were LucasArts. So that's games like um, Monkey Island, The Secret of Monkey Island, and um, Maniac Mansion, and uh, Day of the Tentacle, Sam and Max, you know, all those great games. And also, to a lesser extent, the Sierra games as well. All the games that kind of play in ScumVM, right? So ScumVM's the, this sort of emulator that came out um, I don't know, a while ago now. It's been around for a while. It was originally intended to play just the um, the SCUM games. The um, What did SCUM stand for? Goodness me, I can't remember what SCUM stands for again, but it was the something, something, something for Maniac Mansion. So the, originally it was the engine for Maniac Mansion. So creative interpreter for <laughs> Maniac Mansion or something like that. But basically uh, it was the engine for Maniac Mansion and then was used later on for games like Loom and... Um, and also for um, Secret of Monkey Island and, and many other LucasArts titles. Basically, 
a system called Scum VM came out way, way, way later that allowed you to play these old games in a new environment such as you know Windows XP or Windows 10 or whatever and um, there's been updates to Scum VM you know ongoing it's it's still updated to this very day and somebody has uh, by the name of Mousy Mouse love that name Mousy Mouse um, has come along and said hey why don't we add this cool voxel projection mapping sounds very fancy and there's more by the way i have more stuff if you like the the look of this uh stay tuned to the 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 show because i've got another thing on voxels uh coming up just in a little minute uh in a hot minute um but this is what i'm talking about if you like this then you're going to love the next the next voxel piece of news but this is um this is monkey island with um with in use on Scum VM with uh, voxel projectile projection mapping. I can't even see it. Watch this little picture here, and if you can see what's going on, uh, you'll see there's a difference here. Can you see that zooming in and zooming out there? Can you see the tables kind of, yeah, kind of coming in and out? So that's a very cool kind of what well, make kind of hurts my drunken kind of. <laughs> it's like I've been drinking grog. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you can see that kind of a that three D effect where it kind of zooms in and zooms out. That's the voxelness. Voxelness. That's a kind of car, isn't it, in the UK? Anyway, uh, that's uh, that's a that's a brand new thing. It's a tech preview. It's not even out yet, uh, and it's only for uh, I think at this time uh, the secret of Monkey Island. It's not for any of the other uh, scum games. But you can uh, you can I think look at this on the preview. Um, at this point in time, so um, it's wicked cool, and of course, I'm sure that will be coming to other games in the Scum uh, Scum engines at some point in time. So um, that's really cool that that's coming out, and um, yeah, that that is um, coming sometime soon. So yay, more cool stuff like that. I love to see that um, this is um, we're getting little tweaks to to games that still. I think I mean it's not it's a tweak that doesn't take away from the effect of the game itself. I mean, it, it's still that sort of VGA 256 color graphics. It doesn't hurt the game in any way, really, that I can see. It still looks like the original game. I don't want it to be, you know, a 24 million color graphics game. I don't want that. I want the original game. But it adds that kind of depth, which is cool. It's like a depth of field. Yeah, that's kind of what it's done, depth of field. It sounds like I almost know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Goodness me. The next story is uh, just below that one, uh, also on Lunduk, which I thought, well, you know, I'll, uh, you know, if I'm on the, if I'm, the, I'm on the stealing uh, channel, I might as well just keep stealing. And this one is um, a developer. <laughs> this is absolutely nuts. And uh, I'll just say it right here. It says uh, from from Lunduk, it says in the they did it because they could news. <laughs> One developer is working on recreating the core areas of the classic Mist entirely on a single Atari 2600, uh, 2600 cartridge. Now, I don't know if there's anything super fancy about this cartridge. It says it's, uh, oh, well, it does. It says here, yeah, it says it's an E7 bank switched cartridge. Uh, so it's a 16K ROM with a 2K RAM. So, yeah, I mean, the we talked last time about how the 2600 uh, itself has 128 bytes 128 bytes of ram right so um yeah this thing's got 2k of ram which is still nothing much but if you remember the game mist it was like a hyper card game right it was um uh, well that was the original incarnation anyway it was in um in in uh, in hyper card i think that this sort of in, in, in incarnation but they've actually gone out and made you know, this prototype, I think it's not finished yet, but um, it's just insane uh, what has been done uh, so far in this. So you can see this little preview video of, of this game, of Mist. All of the glori glorious sound effects as well. It's <laughs> just mental. <laughs> I wonder if it's playable. I mean, at some point, you know, whether whether it will be playable. I mean, the graphics are a bit difficult to f 
figure out exactly what's going on. But if you know the game missed well enough, then I guess you could probably figure out what's going on there. Uh, I, I didn't actually play Mist that much as a kid, to be honest with you, because I think, you know, I think it was... A lot of people played it on the Mac. I There were people that played it on the PC, but I didn't have a CD-ROM drive at the time when it came out, and and I think it was it was like one of the the primal the 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 the, the CD-ROM. It was like one of the games that made you go out and buy a CD-ROM drive, and I, I didn't have enough money for a CD-ROM drive right at that time, so missed 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 missed. <laughs> there you go. But hey, look, that's pretty cool. The things that people do with uh, Atari Twenty Six Hundreds to this very day just still continues to blow my mind. So there you go, that is Mist on the Atari 2600 still in active development. Right, okay, now from Atari 2600s on to Apple. Uh, so still keeping it well into the 1970s, from 1970, well, what was, uh, the 2600 was there, uh, was uh, 1977. So we'll go back in time actually, by one year to 1976. And we'll have a look at the Apple One. Uh, this this board was actually uh, created by Steve Wozniak, and probably uh, helped along by Steve Jobs uh, as well. Um, and and it snapped in half. You can see it there. The, <laughs> the board is snap is most definitely not complete. It is in pieces, and not it, it looks like it was. Not only just snapped, it was cut. You know, that that's a proper cut there. That, like, it looks like somebody went crunch like that at some point. And, but there, that looks like it's a proper, like, I've gone methodically with a saw or something like that there. So it was, it was well and truly cut up by somebody. Uh, goodness only knows why and what the story is to what happened with this poor board. But that is an Apple One prototype board and you can see you know the various some pretty good photos of this and uh, apparently it has been uh, authenticated uh, as the as the real deal and there's the 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 hand wiring the hand stitching that um this the bodges that Steve Wozniak was sort of well known for and that's what it was looked like uh, looked like back in the day um uh, when they would arrive at the the bite store um so this sold this this half eaten looking motherboard uh has sold in the last uh week or two at auction uh f to somebody who wishes to remain nameless um and god only knows where it's going to go uh, whether it's going to go to a museum probably not because the person wants to remain nameless um and it's not just sold for pennies it's <laughs> far from it it's actually sold for six hundred and seventy-seven. Wait for it, thousand one hundred ninety-six dollars. Wow, six hundred and seventy-seven thousand one hundred ninety-six dollars. Now, if you recall, I think it was six hundred and sixty-six dollars. These things originally retailed for back in nineteen seventy-six. Might, that might have been the Apple II. I might, might, I might be getting it wrong, but it was what it was either the Apple One or the Apple II that re retailed for six hundred and sixty-six dollars because they like the ring to that. They write the ring to the number, but six seven seven one nine six, including the buyer's premium, whatever that is. That's absolutely insane. So um, it doesn't even work. So just to give you an idea of what a working Apple One goes for, here you go. Here's the same, pretty much the same board. You can see uh, we we flip back to the the photo here. Uh, you can see what it looks like, right? You can tell that they're pretty similar. There's some some of the the CPU is actually been removed from this. You can see the CPU uh, and some of the other important chips have actually been removed from this. So there's no way this is ever ever going to function. But there's, there's one there that functions um, with all the caps on it. And this one sold for 905,000. Uh, and I think that was, yeah, back in 2014. So that would probably sell for about a mil now, at least. Just absolutely mental. Mental, I tell you, mental. <laughs> I don't know. 
So who are these people who are buying these? Um, you know, you've got to be like, but I mean, I, I kind of get it for, for buying a working one that, that I can kind of understand. That's, it is a really important piece of history. If you think about the important computers in the landscape of all things computer, the Apple one is up there, right? It's a, it's a computer that really made a big difference to the world of computing. You know, in a microcomputer, a personal computer, a home computer, all of those things, the Apple one jumped a void. It was part of like the three computers that really jumped over into, you know, a personal space, right? Very important machine. So I get it. That's important. But a thing that looks like it got eaten by Pac-Man. I don't know. <laughs> No, I'm not so sure. Anyway, anyway, I don't know. Uh, right, okay, so back to voxels. Remember voxels? And I'm not talking about cars. I'm talking about graphics. Voxel, right, remember last last time on the Retro Reboot Show, I also talked about um, the uh, Beautiful Doom. It was called Beautiful Doom, and it was like uh, basically a whole bunch of mods have been coming out for um, for Doom. Um, and this is not new, like there's been loads and loads of mods forever coming out for Doom. And it's just like an ongoing thing that these mods just seem to be keeping on coming out. But they seem to be getting better and better and better and better. And this beautiful Doom thing is just really taking taken me back. Like it's just like, like so good. The quality is just superb. Um, but there's just been one thing about all of the textures which has come out for um doom right so all of the upgrades you know that there's been they've been using the same 2d now what i mean by this is probably explained best in this little video here so if you're playing uh gz doom for example it's all upscaled so all, you know we can look up and we can look down and you know mouse look in like we kind of do with a normal modern FPS, uh, but we're still using the same textures that we do with uh, good old Doom, right? So if we have a look, see those sort of gory, bloody dead marine bits in front of you there, if you can see that, I'll press play. Well, as you turn around, you can see that that 2D shape just follows you, right? Same with a dead marine, a uh, dead, um, yeah, dead marine, I think that is, shotgun guy. It just kind of follows you around because the object is flat. Kind of looks like a cardboard cutout. I think the guy in the video of this describes it as. And the the you know these these again they've only got the actual active objects have only got a few placements. I think they're like three sides to them. Okay. So what this uh, voxel doom has done is they've basically gone and redone, repainted. I think all of the enemies and calculated them so you can see that previous there there's there's the default i'll just pause that video there for a moment you can see on the left the default doom or in this case the default gz doom so it's got an upscaled graphics it's in high res and then on the right hand side you can see here the voxel gz doom so you can see that um not only is it higher resolution um graphic it's also fully 3D. So it has differences in 3D all the way around. See that? All the way around. It's not just one 2D thing that you're going around and you're seeing the same thing from all angles. You're seeing it all the way around. So it's truly like, it's like playing, you know, when you saw Quake for the first time, you saw it from all angles right you saw this was like yeah it's kind of like quake or quake 2 rather than than doom so it's a real change so i've already installed this um if you want to install it it's actually really easy to install uh all you need to do is get the latest version of gz doom it has to be the latest version 482 so go to uh, zdoom.org forward slash downloads go to um, moddb.com and search for voxel doom and download the zip file, and then you just drop the zip file onto the GZ Doom executable, 
and then it fires on straight up. And of course you need the Doom 1 wad. It doesn't work yet with the Doom 2 wad, uh, although they are working on that. So there you go, that is um, Voxel Doom. Cool, I think it looks really awesome. Uh, and I wonder, I wonder, I haven't tried this out yet, but I wonder if it will work in tandem with uh, other mods like the, the beautiful Doom stuff. Probably not, but it uh, would be interesting to see. But you can see how cool these, these mods are. They really do um, complement the original look of Doom. I don't think they take away anything from the original look. And that's the important aspect here, I think. Just like the Monkey Island stuff with Scum VM earlier on, I think it's it's not in any way something which takes away from the Doom experience, the original Doom experience from 1993. Really awesome. All right, what's up next? Okay, um, all right, yes, still keeping it with graphics and things. Um, we are going to a place which is about... Um, RLE graphics and um, what are RLE graphics I hear you say and um, the, the RLE graphics is a CompuServe format of graphics so way back in the day when you would go on things like bulletin boards you might have things like ANSI graphics which were basically text format right text mode graphics real uh, basic right so it's like uh, yeah, basically text format graphics. Uh, maybe pictures of little faces and little little patches and stuff like that. And they would they would they would be enhanced slightly to make things look a little bit better than just A to Z characters, but effectively still text mode. Step forward just a little bit from that, and you had um, a few emerging graphics formats online. So this is before the World Wide Web. This is before GIF, and don't tell me it's GIF, it's GIF, right? No arguments, it's GIF, right? <laughs> anyway, I sidetrack. So before GIF, I'm pretty sure it was before GIF, way before JPEG, we had, I think, two things. We had RLE and we had 6L as well, S-I-X-E-L. None of your adult nonsense here, 6L. Okay, and RLE was a format which was known uh, predominantly or exclusively, I think, on CompuServe. And uh, CompuServe, if you don't know, was an... Uh, I'm loath to say an internet service provider because they weren't an internet service provider. They were an online provider. So there was bulletin boards over here. Uh, you would dial up and you'd have this kind of underground experience and it would just... You'd be dialing up some sysops bulletin board and and you'd have this online experience and you'd have messages and other people they, the the sysop might have one line or maybe a few other few telephone lines in his house and and you'd and you you know you'd you'd share his system uh, or her system but uh CompuServe or another online service they would have thousands of lines across a country right um there would other there were other ones like prodigy and genie and I think it was Aladdin and some uh, and a few other ones, The Well, right? So stuff like that. So CompuServe made their own graphics format because they wanted to they wanted to have something a little bit exclusive, a little bit cool, and they made this thing called RLE, and it was uh, still low bandwidth. It was black and white, uh, but it and it was yeah, it was kind of low res, but it was you know for 1987, which is when it came out, uh, it was cool. Now. Um, this web page here, which I'm on, Michael Brutman's web page, um, discusses it in a bit more detail here. But basically, we're talking about at the time baud rates of 300, that's 30 characters per second, 300, 1200, or 2400 bits per second on your telephone line, <laughs> on your screen. Not very good. And you're paying per the minute, right, to get to get this information down. Um, but the, you know, the graphics, the RLE graphics were much better than the ANSI text type graphics that you were getting. They were much better definition, I guess. And the sort of graphics that you could get were, you know, they were realistic, uh, albeit in black and white. And these are the sort of images that you would get. 
And these things have pretty much disappeared um, almost completely. Uh, there's nothing out there that you can interact with them anymore. You can't go on CompuServe. CompuServe's gone. It's dead. Um, you can't, yeah, you just can't dial up anything anymore, which has got them. And so um, Michael as part of, there's there's Prodigy, which is a, which apparently is making a comeback, which is amazing. Um, so things are starting to happen. These are the, out of all, all, out of nowhere, things are happening. But Michael, um, out of nowhere as well, uh, Michael has built up a TCP stack for MS DOS uh, quite some time ago now, um, called the MTCP. And what he's also done is he's added the RLE standard to his Telnet program, and um, he's made a few samples of what it looks like, and uh, you can actually see that over on um, on his YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, you can uh, you can check that out over here. Um, don't know if you can you can see this very well, but um, it's quite small. Let's see if I can pop this out, make it a little bit bigger for you. There's President Abe Lincoln. And it's quite fast. So this is actually running over Telnet as opposed to a dial-up connection, um, which is great. And it's built into uh, Michael's Telnet connection, uh, or his Telnet client, I should say. So there you go. So if you want to check that out, um, you can download the latest version of um, Michael Brutman's Telnet uh, client and also his entire uh, TCP stack for MS-DOS computers. And that's over at brutman.com. Um, so if you just go to yeah, brutman.com and uh, you can click on MTCP and the download link is here. And in, there's a very special version with the RLE graphics support at the, uh, at the bottom of the download links as well. So you need that one as well if you want the MTCP with RLE. Okay, um, all right. The next thing that I have for you is um, this, which I've actually, I actually listened to this ages ago. This is like, um, I don't know why this just popped back up on my radar, but um, it was just posted onto retro computing. I, I think I, I, I think I listened to this, I don't know how long ago, like about a month or two ago. Um, but it's um, Retro Shack, uh, which is a great channel on YouTube. Really like it. Um, and this is a um, an interview with Cliff Lawson of Amstrad, and he was an early uh, apprentice, I think, or an early employee at least of um, Alan Sugar, who is the chief executive of Amstrad. Amstrad being Alan Michael Sugar Trading, if you uh, didn't know. The extension of that name, but Amstrad made the um, CPC six one two eight, uh, the eight two five six, the PCW computers, all those sorts of computers, great machines. I loved them very much, um, and also the PDA and the GX and all sorts of stuff like that. Really good uh, interviews. Um, this gentleman actually made a lot of the stuff to do with those early machines, and also some of the later machines like the Amstrad emailer. So he's got some really good insights in there. Um, so that do check out that. Uh, I, obviously, as usual, I put all of the links of all the stuff in the description on this um, on this very uh, uh, video. So do check it all out. Um, that's uh, yeah. So that's a great interview. It's about an hour long, um, but there's a, a, a table of contents so you can skip to the bits that you're interested in if if you've if you're short on time. Now, the last one that I have in retro news is from <laughs> Hackaday, which uh, I always seem to cover. Pi Pico gives its life for overclocking. It's by Al Williams. This one's just freaking crazy. I thought, you know, I need to have something which is just stupid. Well, <laughs> it goes, how fast can a Raspberry Pi Pico go? Well, apparently the answer is one gigahertz, but only only 
if you freeze it and give it over twice the voltage it normally gets. And oh, just one catch. After a few minutes, the chip will fry itself. Um, that's the results reported by David, who took a Peltier coolier, coolier? Cool, cooler and a pretty serious overvoltage. The dry stone scores went from around 200 to over 1100. Of course, there's that pesky early death to worry about. So you probably won't want to try this at home. So there you go. I just thought I would save you um, from uh, destroying your own personal Pi Pico. Um, as a little adjunct there to finish off the, um, I don't know whether you'd call that gadget news, retro news or something in between, but there you go. That's your Pi Pico overclocking news. Okay, well, now I promised you this day in retro and we'll go over to, first of all, the Osborne. So this time in 1982, people were getting, uh, get the, the world of computing was a very, interesting place because what was happening in uh in in the world of computers is that we had a very busy microcomputer market all of a sudden we had uh the commodore 64 we had the zx spectrum right at the very very bottom end of the market like 99 pounds it was in the uk that's just like nothing that was so so cheap um so that would do for like mum and pop right and then you had and the commodore 64 i think was like 199 pounds it was really cheap i say it in pounds because that's what i knew it was because i lived in the uk at the time right um and then we had the ibm pc which was Mm, I think and it just come out. It was it come out at the end of uh, probably September October of 1981. So it'd been out for about a year, right? By August of 1982. So we have this Z Z80 or Z80 as you Americans like to call it based machine, the Osborne, which was truly luggable. It was um, a portable machine, and I have I have one. It's um, it was, it's just through the room actually, um, and I was still I keep saying I need to do a video on it. I will do a video, I promise. But it it was a it was a really cool machine. It had two floppy disk drives in it. That's a little photo of it. Not a great photo there. Let me try and see if I can bring up a better photograph of the Osborne One computer. So you, you can tell what it looks like a bit better if you've never seen one before. There we go, Wikipedia to the rescue. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and this little tiny itsy bitsy teeny weeny not polka dot bikini nine inch display in the middle monochrome display. It was um, like a bluey whitey thing. <laughs> and these were five and a quarters. Um, Five and a quarter inch disk drives and these little things you could put you could put your floppy disks in there and this full stroke keyboard which was okay ish um my one has got an extra 8088 cpu in it so you could actually run some pc software possibly um but uh kind of like a, a little bit of a hokey machine a very, very strange machine but not not bad just strange um but anyway uh, the PC, as I say, was was selling for around I think three to six thousand dollars, and I think if you wanted a half like a halfway decent PC, like I think the base model was three thousand, and that was sixty four k of RAM, um, and you couldn't really do very much with sixty four k because DOS took up a bit, and you could I think it was like a 180k disk drive or something like that. There was a few gotchas with the base model. So basically, by the time you added it all up and you wanted a, you know, a decent machine, you would spend a lot of more money. So, yeah. So yeah, by the time you got, you looked at the market, you really were spending a lot of money. So the PC was a, a you know, your this side of the market, and then everything else. You had your Ataris, your uh, your Commodores, all of this sort of stuff. And then you had this professional sounding and portable computer from Osborne Computer Corporation. And it was a really 
uh, must have been quite an interesting uh, proposition at the time because they were going out with everything, absolutely everything, and I mean everything. Complete computer. Uh, I think, I don't know if it came with a printer, but it came with the keyboard, the screen, tiny as it was, all of the software, like uh, the spreadsheet, it might have even been VisiCalc, word processor, all the manuals, CPM operating system, you know, so Z80 based processor, as I say, all of that uh, for $17.95 US. So a computer, basically a, a laptop uh, in 1982 for $17.95, which was just pretty unreal. So you can see the advert of the businessman there with his Osborne one. Just <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mega 80s or what, but I mean, it was kind of mind blowing. And then, of course, Osborne shot themselves in the foot and we kind of know what happened there. In fact, it's a big, it's a big history and that's another story, which is why I need to do a video on Osborne. It's basically what happened because the Osborne 2 came out or was about to come out. They, they pre-announced it and kind of shot themselves in the foot. Because the Osborne 1 was still on the market and they said to everybody, oh, buy the Osborne 2 when the Osborne 1 was still on the market. So um, that's, uh, they, they kind of screwed themselves there, really. But um, <clears throat> for for the time, you know, it was a very compelling opportunity to buy buy the machine. So that's, um, that's what was going on uh, at, at this time in 1982. And then also... I thought this was also quite interesting, also from the same magazine at the same time, um, Program Generators. Now, I think this is interesting because at the moment we're going through um, AI, ML, all that stuff. We're really going into this in a big way right now. I think, think there's a lot of um, AI, ML stuff, but also low code, no code stuff. And um, it, it like, the industry always has this funny way, in marketing at least, of saying, this is the brand new, great, fantastic, great new thing, right? <laughs> Have you ever noticed how sometimes, or a lot of times, this great, fantastic, great new thing, well, it just happens not to be that fantastic and isn't actually that brand new and new. It's just rehashed of the same old thing that happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Well, 40 years ago, there was a thing called program generators, which kind of kind of sounds similar to this low code, no code stuff that, you know, Amazon and other people are knocking out, you know, um, these days. And basically, yeah, um, they're basically saying, look, if you want a, if you want a piece of software that will write software for you, um, then there is software that does it for you but it's not actually that great. <laughs> would you, it says here, would you like to be able to tell your computer what you want it to do without having to learn a programming language? Well, you can. You can simply tell your computer what you want in layman's terms and it figures out how you can accomplish your wish to create uh, and creates a program to do it. But they're not as easy to use as some advertising copy suggests. Um, and there's two products that it um, compares. It's basically saying it's uh, four hundred dollars, and, and it just goes on and, and talks about how it how it works. So, yeah, you can read the article in your own in your own time. Uh, there's two products it, it looks at. One called At a Glance. Uh, sorry, uh, the last one, and the other one's called Quick and Easy. Um, one is <laughs> one's actually written in Basic, which I find hilarious. So it must have been so slow because it's an interpreted language in the first case. The other one was machine code. Um, but yeah, uh, one is, uh, I think it was, yeah, $600. And then the other one was $395. So that's, uh, yeah, that was just, that's a lot of money. Um, and they look pretty, pretty, pretty awful. Pretty awful. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so some things never change and everything just gets rehashed. Um, and that's me being a cynic. Um, but hey, what are you gonna do? That's uh, that's the that's the world I am in. Cynic, cynic that I am.
So that brings to a close another one of Al's Geek Labs Retro Reboot Show. Try saying that three times if you've had a few too many boozies. <laughs> um, fortunately for me, I haven't. Um, I would love to say at this point in time a huge, huge big thanks to all of my Patreons and supporters. Please check it out, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. Um, patrons, your names are flashing down the screen right now. I'll read some of them out. Light Fighter Outdoors, Aaron Mavrenk, Mav, Mavrenak, Mavrenak, I'm so sorry. Uh, Robbie Whiting, Jay Harris, Lurian Allen, Mark McDonald, Fat Star Society, Alistair Franklin, Jesse Cousins, Humdrum Conundrum, Meat Lotion, Bob Brown, and Trady11, you guys, absolutely rock thank you so much for your continued support if you would like to join me as i say patreon.com forward slash al's geek lab or you can press the join button here on youtube if you do um, it's great because it helps so much it spurns me on it gives me that little bit of a boost to uh, to get going with the channel and it also helps with the uh, the added costs i mean there are lots of costs um just uh, just um Premiere Pro, for example, those people that make so much money at Adobe, I don't know how they, they justify it, but it's $48 per month for Premiere Pro. I'm looking at you, Adobe. It's <laughs> a lot of money. Anyway, there you go. I'm just naming and shaming now. Um, so, these are, these are costs that we have to bear as, uh, as content creators, and I, uh, I, do this for, I do this for the love, the subs, the likes, and getting this uh, retro, um, this retro goodness out to you guys. I do hope you enjoy the content. Um, if you do, please subscribe to the channel. Please, please, please <laughs> press that thumbs up. And uh, I'd love to hear your comments, your feedbacks, your suggestions for future episodes in the uh, comments below. Until the next time, see you soon, and take care of everyone. Be excellent to each other. Bye bye.